is the work of the technical advisory committee is trying to think through ways of, you know, how do we make that assessment of what cities are doing and, and how they're making progress in their own way towards these outcomes. Um, and so, you know, those things within the control of the local government, if a city like Cornelius or any other city is, you know, taking actions to zone their, um, their community to allow additional housing types, you know, that is, that is definitely within the city's control and they should receive, you know, quote unquote credit for, you know, that kind of approach to, you know, addressing their housing need. And so it's, it's really looking at those kind of things that cities can do, you know, the levers that the cities can pull to accommodate additional housing, not necessarily um, if there's outside factors that are just suppressing the amount of production in a local government. And I guess I didn't ask my question exactly the way I need to, because part of it, it has to do with um, how will the allocations be meted out um, in my mind, um, the city already has quite a bit of affordable housing and our housing stock is lower in value than the remaining um, Portland metro region. So in my, um, my council's mind, we already provide a lot of affordable housing and we're fiscally challenged. So it's it's a it's a difficult situation to add more regulated housing that would remove remove property from the tax roll. So I'm wondering if there will be any um, ability to remedy that kind of situation where you're already fiscally challenged. We are as um, as cut to the bone as possible in terms of staff. And yet we do want to provide housing, but we just can't do it in terms of um, affordability. Yeah. Th thank you, Barbara. And I think I'm also hearing sort of how will cities be credited for the affordability they have today? So yeah, Sean, quickly, and then we'll move along here. Yeah, absolutely. So, so you know, and just a note, on, I think there's a few components of this question. One is on the like process for the allocations, right? Remember we mentioned OHCS, right? They're doing a parallel process where they're determining the ONA methodology, the allocations to local governments, right? And they're gonna make recommendations to DAS. So there's gonna be a process, there's gonna be an opportunity for comment as part of that process. Um, so just keep that in mind. I think the other piece is, I think there's kind of two components of this question. One is on that kind of fair share of uh, housing. I mean, in part, right? What this policy is, is a shift away from what used to you know, say for communities with very significant affordable housing, when they would do their housing needs analysis, they would be, as a consequence of having a lot of affordable housing, saddled with most of the burden of planning for affordable housing, right? Because of that nature of projecting the past into the future that local projections did, right? And this is a change to say, we have the system that is going to allocate a share of the overall need to all communities within a region, right? So that is a very significant change, right? And I think one of the things that we can explore as part of this is how do we ensure that we're, you know, taking actions in response to need, but also thinking about like, how do we build fiscally resilient communities, right? I think all, almost every jurisdiction has different kind of budget problems that, that are related to, you know, the, the development patterns that they have. I think one of the things that we absolutely should consider, especially in the context of infrastructure or, or other components is like, how do we make sure that our cities are going to be fiscally resilient, that they have the resources they need and the capacity they need to do, to take on this work, right? I think that's going to be absolutely a critical part of it. So just recognizing all three of those those components that you mentioned, just wanted to give a, a little bit of life to each one of them. Thank you. Yes, thank you all. Um, so just going to wrap up housing accountability for now. This conversation will continue. I think some of the other tacks will be talking about how the work they're doing sort of feeds into this as well along the way. Um, I went ahead and uh, brought up the, the board again. There's some more off the screen here, but you can um, look at them uh, when you get into the board yourself. But some of the high points that we just talked about, um, you know, really needing some objective and very clear direction um, around accountability 
Um, and then a lot of the concerns we just talked about, um, including sort of just acknowledging city sphere of control and authority and um, just sort of all going in this, knowing we're all trying to do the right thing and getting more housing on the ground and um, serving more people. And um, that also means um, that the state also has a responsibility in that, and there needs to be some accountability system for the state itself um, in removing those barriers. So I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna move us on to the next topic, the needs and production. Um, and you will see, uh, those of you in the mirror board, if you just go, um, well, if you pan out, you can see where it is, but the big green box, it looks like many of you have already found it. So thank you for that. Um, and Madi, I think you're gonna give us a little overview um, of the issues for this TAC, and then we'll go back to the mirror board and discussion. Yeah, thank you, Deb. Um, hi, everyone. Good morning again. My name is Madi. I'm a housing planner with the department. Um, as Deb mentioned, I will be covering with my colleague Celestina Teba the needs and production topic area. Like the previous topic area, the hot tack, um, this uh, this topic area, the nap tack, we get a fun name. Um, also has three major um, kind of policy issues and associated questions that um, that the team uh, you know was able to gather from kind of the direction of House Bill two thousand one, and those are the ones that you see here on your screen. The first being um, defining needed housing to to support abundant and diverse um, housing options, integrating um, affirmatively furthering fair housing into goal 10, and then developing adoption ready housing pr production strategies to support our local government partners and doing the really good work on the ground. Um, I think uh, before I dive into the first two, and then Celestino will take on the last one, um, I do want to make an important note that the rules that are um, that we design under this particular topic area, they are due per the bill on January 1st of 2025. So something to keep in mind. All right. So with that, let's let's get into the first um a kind of major issue area within this topic area, and that's defining needed housing. Um, we've had a lot of really good discussion in that previous discussion around this this particular issue area, but I'm just um, going to kind of re reiterate some of the important points and then, um, you know, offer to the group the, the significant question that we'll have to grapple with. And so earlier when Sean was describing kind of the big changes, um, you know, I think something to keep in mind that House Bill 2001, among many, many things that it adopted, it really did, it, it adopted the Oregon Housing Needs Analysis methodology. And this major policy change fundamentally reorients the way that cities will be planning for housing around this specific methodology. So you heard earlier what this means is cities will now receive an allocation of need from the state and it's going to be segmented uh, by affordability. And then um, earlier Sean mentioned that um, it's a fair share kind of system and, and that's very true. All, all communities in Oregon have a responsibility for, um, for a share of the overall need in our state. And which is is different from the old system where, you know, the, the need was determined at the local level through the population projection forecast and that associated work that Sean mentioned earlier in the old system. So um, I think the important piece to underscore, uh, which Sean did underscore earlier, but it is important to ground us is this collective approach, the share um, of the housing need. Um, kind of allocation aims to ensure that the various dimensions of housing, especially for historically marginalized communities, such as people experiencing homelessness, people um, with disabilities of all kinds, and, you know, communities of color are not overlooked. And so this this fundamental change does kind of address the shortcomings with the previous system. In the old way, as um, we heard earlier, uh, local governments tended to project uh, past development patterns into the future, and um, this did tend to have, um, 
you know, a uh, tendency to not uh, plan necessarily the right way for our current and future community members and, and their respective financial capabilities. But now local governments do um, need to put, will need to be planning for more housing and more diverse housing options in their community as part of their housing planning obligations under the statewide planning goal 10. So with that said, the big policy question that the NAPTAC folks um, will will need to grapple with is how to best support our, our local government partners and in, in translating that own a, own a housing need into kind of this holistic big picture of the community's needed housing. So in other words, how do we, you know, develop rules that are going to set up cities to, to, you know, make those local determinations that help us achieve equitable access to um, affordable housing for all members, regardless of protected class. And when I mean protected class, that's a federal term that uh, refers to race, gender, orientation, ability, age, etc. And then also, you know, thinking about where housing is located in a community. Um, does it meet the needs of various family sizes? Uh, does it meet the needs of folks who have um, disabilities? So thinking about accessibility and, and, and does it offer opportunity to community assets like good um, schools, equitable employment opportunities, uh, reliable transportation, community centers, all the things that we all want in our neighborhoods. So that is kind of the big question there is how do we support local governments and translating that need at the local level. With that, if we can move on to the next slide, the, the second kind of bigger uh, policy issue and associated questions to kind of grapple with here. We've heard it a, num a number of times in this first half of the presentation is a um, significant change that came out of the bill also was now this um, requirement for local governments to affirmatively further fair housing as part of their housing production strategy work. And so, um, you know, what does affirmatively furthering fair housing mean? If, on the slide here is the definition uh, of what's exactly in the in the bill, um, but really at the core, um, what this means it's a it's really a federal policy initiative aimed at promoting fair housing practices and addressing housing discrimination. Um, the con concept of AFFH is rooted in the Fair Housing um, Act, which was passed in 1968 as part of the Civil Rights Act. Um, and really the goal is to go beyond just simply prohibiting discrimination in housing. It's really about taking um, kind of an active and meaningful uh, approach um, and taking actions that will address significant disparities in housing needs and um, uh, allow access to opportunity by eliminating some of the barriers that we see uh, on the ground to, to folks um, having the ability to have housing choice. Um, right now, the AFFH practice, um, you know, typically is more well known in the federal kind of um, atmosphere. Um, it is, uh, you know, as I mentioned, it is kind of a mandate that came out of the Fair Housing Act. And um, there, the, so federal agencies, but also recipients of federal funds um, kind of have this common language common um, language around EFFH. But I will note there are a lot of um, communities across our state um, and many of us here in the room are supporting, you know, good, equitable uh, uh, housing production practices. And so really the, the important piece here is is basically taking these, um, you know, promising practices. Goal 10 has always had this intent to have affordable uh, homes that all members of our communities can um, can really access and thrive. And that's an AFFH really um, kind of, um, the intent is also that, but it also is um, a little bit, for, it goes a little bit further by ensuring that, you know, um, we're all taking an active and meaningful approach to it. Uh, and so that is what we get to grapple with is how do we take some of the practices from AFFH and, and some of the work there and, and bring it together uh, into our goal 10 planning system. 
Before we move on to the next one, I do have to give a major kudos and shout out to Commissioner Lazo, who I see is on, on the call today. These two images that you see here in front of you come from his presentation that he delivered to, um, to us and various folks who attended the Housing Land Advocates Conference earlier this year in March. And, um, you know, a, a lot of fair housing advocates have been waiting for this monumental moment to be able to really kind of um, marry the relationship of um, AFFH into our planning system. And that's the way that Commissioner Lazo described it, which I which sound which resonates with me. And so I thought I would share that's the that's the intent behind the second policy issue is how can we build a loving relationship between these two um, two promising, you know, systems to ensure that we're we're supporting lo local governments on the ground to to work towards the the equitable outcomes we want to see and support folks who who you know have been um, kind of excluded and ensuring they get to thrive and access the the work the the housing and the opportunities that we all want for um, to see too. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague Celestina who will describe the final major policy issue. Thank you so much, Mari. Um, good morning again, everybody. Celestina Teva, she and they pronouns. Um, I am here to talk through, again, like Mari said, this third portion, which is um, really well suited to be presented right after um, what we just spoke about, because the framework for why we're talking about adoption ready housing production strategies um, is having identified that there is a need that I heard on the call today for support uh, from the state to local jurisdictions. In so one way that we've identified uh, a potential uh, pathway for support, um, as well as our legislators identified and actually provided funding for in House Bill 2889, um, passed also earlier this year, as Ethan mentioned, um, is to provide or to develop and make available adoption ready housing production strategies. Um, and what does that actually mean? Well, to pull back to the housing capacity analysis and housing production strategy work, um, what we already have in place uh, at the state level for support to local jurisdictions is um, kind of like a menu or a suite of potential strategies that local jurisdictions might consider, uh, including in their housing production strategy plans. Um, and, and it's not exhaustive. Of course, as many of you know, um, jurisdictions can also pursue additional strategies. Uh, but what doesn't exist yet is adoption ready strategies. So um, strategies that actually are fleshed out and, and are ready for local jurisdictions, councils, um, commissions to go ahead and adopt and implement. So uh, on the needs and production uh, tack, we have uh, what is a, a really exciting and, and really powerful. And therefore, you know, we have a responsibility, but we're exciting opportunity to think about what kinds of adoption ready housing production strategies um, should DLCD uh, flesh out and make available and uh, I'm going to pull back again to uh, some of their work in our TAC because this is a pathway for us to look at um, how we affirmatively further fair housing and providing these tools, these fleshed out strategies for utilization um, is directly related to getting to all of those outcomes. So we have here on the slides today um, a few examples of, of local jurisdictions who are already um implementing actually housing production strategies or, or really fleshing out what some of these strategies might look like. Um, so, you know, the types of strategies range uh, pretty substantially. It could be code language that a local jurisdiction might adopt. It could be plan sets like adoption ready um, or, or ready build plan sets for accessory dwelling units or other middle housing types. Um, it could be a program that's suited to serve uh, historically and, and often currently underserved communities like uh, age and place programs um, and uh, accessible needs programs where there's maybe a development pathway uh, and a planning pathway to develop that type of housing. Uh, and even programs and strategies uh, 
like land acquisition uh, for affordable housing development. So um, the types of strategies that might work, we might consider, again, are broad codes, building plans, targeted development programs, funding pathways like TIF, TIF districts and tax increment financing. Um, and so we get to dig into that on the NAPTAC. Um, and hopefully, uh, or, or I'm thinking you all might have uh, some notes today in our Q&A. And then the last item on, on this um, part of our work in the SNAPTAC, uh, and in your packets, uh, in your two-pager on this particular attack, you'll see a question or, or a prompt that asks us to consider how these strategies um, actually play into some of the uh, capacity and urbanization tax work and, and the work of all of the state and the cities in providing needed housing, which is that all of the housing production strategies um, are essentially opportunities to complete efficiency measures before a jurisdiction needs uh, an urban growth boundary amendment. Um, so how we develop housing production strategies works in concert with the middle housing model code that already exists, works in concert with the climate friendly equitable communities um, rulemaking uh, and framework there to provide jurisdictions with essentially readily available efficiency measures to pursue um, to provide needed housing uh, or the, and at least the conditions of needed housing in their communities in advance of uh, applying for an urban growth boundary amendment if that's needed. So with that, I will hand it back over to Deb. Wonderful. Thank you, Mari and Celestina. I really appreciate that. So uh, needs and production, um, uh, tech issues, as just mentioned, sort of abundance and diverse options, um, addressing uh, fair housing and affirmatively furthering fair housing, and then the adoption ready um, housing production strategies. We're going to do the same thing, just take a moment. I see many of you have already found the board and there's lots of interesting um, comments on it. Let me just do a quick share. Uh, let's just take another 30 seconds or so um, for those of you who hadn't had a chance to interact with the whiteboard. Um, and uh, let's just do that. We'll stay quiet for a minute and then we can come back to a discussion. And Barbara, I saw your hand up, so I'll, I'll be there in a minute. All right, uh, let's see if we can get a little bit of a discussion going. I know this is strange, y'all. Thank you for the grace um, to have 55 people trying to have a constructive discussion virtually, but we're gonna keep going. Um, and I really appreciate the sort of written comments as well for those of you who are maybe find it challenging to have this um, virtual conversation. I'm seeing, I especially appreciate everyone. It looks like many of you are really thinking about those questions about different populations, how to serve underserved and vulnerable populations better with our housing um, and some of the key elements that might look like in, in rulemaking um, and really thinking about location and connection, socially connected housing, um, accessible housing, thinking about aging in place, et cetera. Um, and then I'm also seeing some interesting uh, uh, not not surprisingly interesting um, challenges on um, uh, sorry policy tensions that are out there the sort of push and pull the need for a, a variety of state resources and uh, or other resources for infrastructure and other things um, and funding um, but also just general um, yeah tensions between other policies that everyone's trying to meet at the same time. I'm going to stop sharing so we can see one another, but please continue along there. Um, 
and wondering what you all uh, have to say or thoughts you have about the elements, best outcomes for achieving legislative direction or any of those specific policy tensions. Anything you see surprising up here? I'm not afraid to call on people. <laughs> Go ahead, Barbara, thank you. Um, I just wanna say that I really appreciate the um, idea of having plan sets that we could use um, and the programs out of the box. One of the things that would help me as, as um, a smaller jurisdiction is having an idea with the technical work behind the scenes how many staff people are administering that program in that jurisdiction? What is the annual budget for that program in that jurisdiction? So that could help me when I go to my council to either downsize it so that I can tell my council, this is approximately how much it might cost for this particular program. Can we, can we do this? Um, those kinds of things would be helpful for me. Um, so thank you. I do appreciate the idea of having the model codes. Wonderful, thank you. Samantha, so hoping your, your uh, audio is working here. Oh, we can't hear you, Samantha. Dog on it. Yeah, Gust. Gust, is that right, Gust? Thank you. Yeah, the T is silent. Okay, yes, got it. Uh, I wanted to say um, that I've noticed uh, I'm a, I'm a rural, um, rural housing developer, and I've noticed over the past uh, few months, two or three months, that we've seen rural communities uh, reaching out to us and other uh, developers that I've spoke to about um, how they can get in the game. And I think that's going to be an important um, uh, item for communities to recognize is that it's going to take um, direct effort like that, trying to figure out what what are my options. And I really like that slide you just put up with the um, with a plan that's established that um, people can use for an ADU. Uh, it just kind of jumpstarts um, kind of the juices flowing, if you will. But um, having, uh, I think it's important to realize that the communities are going to have to really take some initiative because uh, what will create that um, that that um, growth in your communities is likely just going to take um, effort, and it's not going to just organically happen. So, um, just thought that was uh, great to to see communities reaching out and that um, they're trying to get started. Really nice feedback. Thank you for that. And yeah, an important piece to remember, it's not just those plan sets or those ideas, but the connections to, develop, to developers and property owners who may want to um, interact with those and build some relationships. Thank you. Uh, Kim. Hi, I'm going back to um, affirmatively furthering fair housing. I'm wondering what the state will be doing to help local jurisdictions assess their housing needs. Um, and I say this because sometimes, you know, we hear from jurisdictions saying, I would love to, to do that, but I don't have the capacity or the staff to do that kind of analysis. Yeah, great. Uh, thank you for the question. Mari, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, thank you, Kim, for the question. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll offer some initial thoughts, but if any of my other colleagues want to build on what I, I offer, please do. I invite that and welcome that. Um, so the, the, the work that falls under um, OHCS's role is really kind of the crux of your of the response there. They are developing this um, uh, dashboard and equity indicators. This dashboard is it is containing a lot of data to to better support local governments as they're working through their housing production uh, planning uh, work. And so, um, hopefully, the intent there is to kind of for us the state to take on that analytical work and offer it to to the to the local governments to be able to do the the really important work which is 
developing the the production strategies and tools and policies at the local level that will help achieve those um, equitable outcomes. And so, yeah, uh, I mean, we mentioned this uh, uh, previously. There is that parallel kind of program that will be um, will be kind of led by our um, state agency partner OHCS. Um, however, uh, our our department gets to to offer recommendations, and we'll be working in close collaboration with them. And so, I could see there being, you know, some some important overlap. Uh, here in the NAPTAC to that work. And so we'll we'll have to figure out how to navigate that. But the intent there is to be supportive um, through that dashboard on the analytical piece. Great, thank you. I'm sure there'll be much more discussion about that as well through the TAC meetings. Uh, Samuel, yes, please. Thinking through this, I'm, I'm wondering if um, as a result of these TACs, there's going to be any kind of report that um, that gets generated by the department or, or something. If we identify things that are outside of our remit, but need a clear legislative fix, if there will be some kind of follow up like the like the ONA report or, 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 or like that, um, that, you know, I in this in this particular question, I was thinking about the continued challenges of HOAs and CCNRs um, that have existing rules that are keeping out needed housing. And that's obviously not something that we are going to solve on the tax. So um, if, if there's, a, you know, if, if there's a clear highlighted needs going forward, if, if we, that we surface, um, will that be going to the legislature? Well, first, thank you for acknowledging that we're not going to solve that on the tax. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, Ethan, have you given that any thought? I'll I'll uh, kick that over to you. That might be something we're still working on. Yeah, thanks, Deb, and good question, Sam. One of the things that we're, um, you know, we're aware of those kind of things that are going to come up uh, throughout this process and actually kind of kicking around some ideas of how we capture those, right? And it's important. It's just a matter of how we're going to capture those, but we definitely will be, um, you know, collecting those kind of things that are, you know, part of this process somewhat, but aren't really within the authority of DLCD or really even, you know, we working with our partners uh, within different state agencies, OHS in particular, but kind of just maintaining those in um, something like a, you know, a little side report or something like that. So uh, we're we're definitely on board for for doing that, and I think it'll be a, an important kind of just description of what's what's next. What what else should we tackle as part of this process? So we'll be taking note of that. Yeah, thank you, Ethan. Really important question to think about those things outside of this that are still having an impact on housing production, negative impact on housing production. Uh, Brock, please. So kind of a, a broader level question, but I think applies most directly here. So um, I know one of the things that, you know, we've said on the slides and we want to consider is uh, housing that's climate resilient. What is our working definition of climate resilient? Because I think there's um, a pretty broad range that could be encompassed there. Um, I don't just want to kind of set a baseline of, you know, understanding what, what we're referring to when we talk about climate resilience. Very good. I don't think we'll answer that today, but that's a good one to follow up with later, unless Ethan, you have specific thoughts on that. I, I don't think we have a specific definition of what that means. I, you know, I think uh, that's more of a something that we'll have to tackle with, uh, you know, with you all as part of this, this work about, you know, like, what does that mean? And that comes directly from the from HB 2001, as Brock is mentioning. So, you know, yet another responsibility of the of the group here to try to figure out, you know, like what that means, how do we do it, what's the functionality of of making good on that uh, direction from the legislature. So, but there's no like capital C, capital R, you know, definition anywhere. Thanks. Great. Uh, with that, I'm going to just take us to a break. I see there's been a little bit of <laughs> chaos on the Miro board, so I'm not going to bring it up. I think there was a little uh, sticky board reorganization. We'll we'll sort that out. 
Um, I can bring it up uh, maybe after the break. And now that I know the actual hour, uh, let's just take five minutes. So, you know, at um, 11 minutes past the hour, um, and then we'll come back. I'm trying to, you know, get us out of here before noon, and I think we're on track for that. So let's take five, um, and we'll be right back to carry on the conversation with uh, capacity and urbanization. Thank you all.
Okay. Gathering for the last topic, the home stretch. I think we can do it. Um, I see you all are already thinking about it, which is fabulous. We're going to do the same thing. We're going to wrap it up uh, maybe in a half an hour or so. Let's see. I don't want to cut any discussion short. I'll say that up front. Um, but let's go ahead and move forward with getting just the high points overview from uh, Cotton. All right. Thank you, Deb. Um, hopefully, everybody remembered to bring their snacks with them this morning in case you're already thinking about lunch. Thank you so much for hanging in there with us. Um, so real high level overview, um, we, I guess first I want to start off by saying DLCD, the Department of Land Conservation Development now has an urbanization team within the housing division. Uh, most of us were newly hired onto this team over the summer and the fall. I think for the sake of time, I'll let my colleagues introduce themselves and we'll each go over the topic areas. But the charge we were given by the Land Conservation Development Commission was to provide greater clarity, greater certainty to our local government partners around their urbanization processes. And these include things like our buildable lands inventory, um, which is refining those methodologies around our um, assumptions and estimates of capacity, um, facilitating public facilities and concept planning. So when we think about development readiness of lands, whether that's new lands brought into the UGB or areas already in the UGB and are they feasibly developable? And then creating clarity and certainty um, around the UGB amendments, um, whether that's facilitating land exchanges or creating a path, that, um, an easier path and a clearer path for creating your urban re and rural reserve areas. Um, I've been spending time on the mural board and it's amazing the comments in there. So I think you guys will find some comfort in what we're about to cover. Um, I did want to highlight that this body of work around capacity and urbanization, we do have a different timeline. So we have a little bit more time for the CALTAC to work on and delve on these issues. And that um, language, our final language should be adopted by LCDC by January 1st, 2026. So we'll have a little bit more time. Um, so with having said that, I think I will let my colleagues introduce themselves and maybe we'll delve deeply into our buildable lands inventory and look at what all um, we're going to be discussing with the capacity and urbanization tech in that area. Jenna, can I pass it over to you? Yes, thanks, Cotton. Um, hi again. My name is Jenna Hughes, Housing and Growth Management Analyst with DLCD and one of the point people for the capacity and urbanization work. And one of the major policy areas we'll be exploring in the capacity and urbanization TAC is refining BLIs or buildable land inventories. And I know a lot of you are familiar with BLIs, but just to reiterate, this is one part of a housing capacity analysis. And the process involves identifying constraints to development and estimating the development capacity and how many units could realistically be built, um, including making assumptions about housing types and location. And uh, the picture on the slide is an example from the city of Medford's last BLI. Um, and the major questions we'll be seeking to answer in this rulemaking are, uh, one, which methodological approaches for a buildable lands inventory should be incorporated into the administrative rules and guidance documents to provide, to provide cities with certainty in adopting housing capacity analyses. And two, how do we balance analytical complexity with accurately assessing the capacity of lands within the urban growth boundary in varying contexts? So as described in the capacity and urbanization overview that was included in your packet, our goal will really be to articulate the range of options for how to inventory land and constraints, as well as estimate the capacity for different size cities, um, looking not just at the number of housing units, but also the diverse range of housing options within the urban growth boundary. Um, so with that, I will now pass it to Madeline Phillips to talk about the next set of policy questions that we'll be exploring in this work. Thanks, Jenna. Uh, good, after good morning, everyone, almost afternoon. 
Uh, my name is Madeline Phillips, and I am the public facilities planner with the housing, the urbanization team within the housing division. Uh, it's a, a pleasure to, to see some familiar faces on this call, and I apologize again for some review or some um, reiteration of the same topics from yesterday, but we've already begun this conversation a bit with some of the comments around infrastructure, um, particularly related to the de definition within House Bill 2001 related to development readiness. Uh, many of you have heard or have struggled with challenges related to infrastructure such as phantom capacity within cities, either because of inadequacy of, of public facilities or like water, sewer and streets, or failing infrastructure that can't serve up zoning or efficiency measures that uh, a planning effort might identify. And further, there are still yet challenges with, with land within earth, urban growth boundaries that, that we may see um, sit vacant for decades uh, that, that have been identified for growth, but are for one reason or another due to infrastructure infeasible. Um, so some of the questions we'll be looking at through the Capacity and Urbanization Technical Advisory Committee will be considering methods for cities to assess development readiness, um, particularly as they're identified in a BLI or buildable land inventory, as Jenna mentioned. And then thinking a little bit more holistically about actions that integrate public facilities uh, with the urbanization process. So many of you typically reserve some of those conversations for um, exercises with your public works departments or uh, for the representatives thereof that, um, that guide either through special districts or otherwise. Um, we're hoping that we'll be looking to integrate these public facilities planning efforts um, into the discussion of production, affordability, and choice of housing options so that we're encouraging development readiness of lands that either are infill opportunities or are activated through an urban growth boundary swap or amendment. Um, this might include addressing timeliness of buildable lands uh, in particular, both existing in cities and in, in future, in, in future UGBs or in the growth boundary currently. And in doing so, we hope that the conversation will identify synergy opportunities where cities can capitalize on better and better defined, capitalize on opportunities and better defined challenges um, so that production and implementation are successful. From there, I'll pass it over back to Karen uh, to describe urban growth boundaries and some of the urban reserves work that we'll be pursuing in this tech. All right, we're about to wrap this up. So we'll delve into this third piece. Um, part of our charge was to create greater clarity around the urbanization goal 14 and your UGB amendment processes. Um, I think the major policy question to take away here is, um, when we look at the work of our local partners, what amendments to current rules, what guidance materials might be needed for these urbanization related work? Um, and how do we better support the cities who need to pursue a UGB amendment, a land exchange, an urban or rural reserve um, as they work towards accommodating their, their community's housing needs? So this might include facilitating the adoption of um, the reserves, whether urban or rural in our non-metro city. And effectively, I think, our local partners see this as an opportunity to front load a lot of the analytical work of planning um, and growth before they actually have this urgent or um, behind um, feeling behind on meeting their land needs for housing production. Additionally, we're looking at providing analytical flexibility. So what does that look like around land exchanges? Um, how do we accommodate allowing cities to swap out lands that are unfeasible to develop and looking at what lands might be able to be brought in under these processes? Um, also developing comprehensive guidance materials so local governments can facilitate their um, urbanization processes with minimal or at least less risk of appeal, less litigation, um, I think in, in this respect, the department lacks a lot of guidance materials or what little bit is available has been very outdated. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity to put together additional information there. And um, lastly, overall, I think the goal that we wanna to work towards with our CALTAC members, our capacity and urbanization members are how do we as a group make recommendations 
that create a process that's more accessible for our local government partners, provides additional analytical flexibility in the work they're required to do, while also supporting this urbanization process that stands up to appeals and litigations. Um, and I see in the mirror board as well, really thinking about funding of urbanization work. Um, we've heard from local governments that they don't have the staff capacity, they don't have the resources. Is there any opportunity for the state to provide and fund and support um, the work that they're doing? And I will note, I mentioned the timeline earlier that our um, rule language is to be adopted by the commission January 1st of 2026. When we look at the guidance materials that we're creating, we have that timeline and we can even adopt guidance materials after the timeline. So I think part of our task at hand is really thinking about how are we concise and clear in the rules and how can we get very comprehensive, detailed and supportive in our guidance materials and thinking that we don't have to necessarily feel rushed on all these pieces. I know January 2026 seems like a long time away, um, but I have a feeling we'll get close to that date and have work at hand. So I want to, let's see, Deb, are we able to go back to our mirror board at this time? Yes, that would be great. And thank Looking you. Looking good in there, by the way. It is. It's amazing. I'll, I'll give it a share, though. It's starting to get um, too big to, to see very well. Um, unless you're on your own uh, uh, device looking at it. Um, and thank you also for mentioning the desire to really get clear and concise rules in place that really um, sort of hit these big points um, and work the details out in the guidance documents. Um, I think that'll be important for all of them. This is an interesting one too, when I'm looking at the Miro board, it's so, um, you're starting to see the, the integration and overlap with all the topics, um, sort of the things that came up in needs and production around getting the right location, thinking about all these folks, those are sort of showing up in the housing, um, uh, sorry, capacity and urbanization section as well, and this sort of um, tension with that. And then also sequencing of when the infrastructure's there, when the housing's there, where that goes. Um, uh, and then of course the accountability floods into that. So um, other thoughts or things you all are seeing as you're looking at the mirror board or would you would like to um, just sort of elevate the comments that you've added into the mirror board about um, capacity and urbanization discussion, technical issues, tensions? Yeah, Damien. Thanks. I had um, two things to elaborate on for my uh, notes on the mirror board. One was on uh, the topic of urban reserves and um, asking if there's an opportunity in this work to look at how uh, some of the heavy lifting we do with a UGB amendment could become part of the work that we do for urban reserves so that UGB amendments are, to the extent possible, a little bit more straightforward if we're all looking at, you know, land in the same priority class and then focusing more on infrastructure. My other comment regarding um, public facilities was in also recommending that um, this work look at how cities coordinate with private utilities that provide infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And I'm speaking from my experience in Bend where we have, um, we don't have any special districts that we coordinate with regarding, like, say, water or wastewater. Uh, but we do have private water utilities, and they present um, their own challenges in terms of coordinating, uh, sharing information, uh, just understanding what their infrastructure capacity is, especially if we're looking at making a land use decision that might either change zoning or bring land inside an urban growth boundary, and not having a lot of confidence that they've got good data on what they're able to serve in terms of uh, not only, you know, water for domestic purposes, but also for fire flow. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Damien. Um, any comments or thoughts either about the um, comment Damien just had about urban reserves and the desire maybe to find some simplicity um, for UGB expansions using that tool? And then also this, you know, sort of open-ended question about how to coordinate or how are special districts coordinating, especially those that are small and providing really necessary services? Yeah, I think to the, the first topic, Deb, thanks for the opportunity. Um, I think that is definitely within the realm of what we want to explore. Those will be the topics we'll delve into is 
that work that's done for UGB amendment, and then how much of that or what is applicable to your urban reserve work? How do we integrate that? Or how does one lead to the other? How does, um, or vice versa, how the other feeds into the urban reserve process? So thank you for bringing that up, Damien. Um, the utilities, you know, for me, this is um, a particularly interesting area that I don't have a lot of expertise, so I'll probably um, refer to Maddie if she has any comments. But, you know, I have seven years with, that I worked at the city of Gresham, and I know we have a representative here from the city. And working with your public municipal water services, your special district water services, um, a private water service or utility um, you know, that is a very interesting concept that I'm not very familiar with, but definitely these are the things we want to delve into and explore further. So I think you bring up some really interesting topics here. And Maddie, you are, you have been steeped in these conversations around um, services. So I'd love to hear from you. Thanks, Karen. Damien, you bring up a great point. I, I think one thing that is true about many communities throughout the state is that we have a patchwork of utility service providers, some of which are regulated publicly, some are privately regulated or have limited regulation, as you've alluded to, um, in terms of their obligation to work collaboratively with cities, especially around this question of growth and or um, enhancement of development, upzoning and, and otherwise. Um, so I, I think that there is room for that conversation in our, our work. In fact, it's essential. Uh, because we'd like to, uh, for for, at the risk of oversimplifying, we'd like for all the boxes we color in different colors to be meaningful in, in at the point of development. So if we zone something for density, we'd like to be able to a, a route of feasibility for that development to occur. And I think that's where some of the challenges that many Bend has faced, uh, among other communities of various sizes throughout the state. So thanks for raising that. More to come on that and a really important one. Anyone else have thoughts about Damien's comments on urban reserves, um, special districts coordination collaboration or anything else regarding capacity and urbanization? Yeah, Casera. Hi, so, and I'm with a special district. Um, and I think that, you know, this discussion got me thinking actually about the um, dashboard, something that we struggle with is that data. Um, you know, it's not just the number of housing units that might be going in an urban reserve area, but right, the location and the timing are really important. So as much as we can be transparent and, and include some of that information, um, you know, obviously we do a lot of coordination with our cities, but streamlining it um, so that special districts and private utilities um, can, can track that, I think will just, um, you know, be a tremendous help. Wonderful, thank you for that perspective too. Anyone else have thoughts about the capacity and urbanization topic? They get an extra year to keep talking about this, <laughs> which is nice. Deb, I simultaneously feel that like that's a luxury we have, and at the same time, I know. Ooh, that time's gonna go by quick. Absolutely, absolutely, and also, I mean, just as we're talking, it's it's um, you know, I'm just reflecting back some of the folks from jurisdictions sort of sharing a little, um, I don't know if anxiety is the right word, but a little anxiety about the accountability program and what they're being held accountable to. And as we think about the sort of all the things that are not in their sphere of control, especially with special districts and growth, um, I get that. Uh, and we'll we'll keep sort of talking about how to get that, that balance right and acknowledge um, the various things that groups are working on. Yes, Samuel. No, I guess to that point, I was on a, a panel a couple months ago with a planner from Sisters who said, we would love to build apartments, but our fire truck doesn't have a, a ladder that can <laughs> that can uh, reach and therefore we can't build apartments. And um, yeah, so there's a lot of non-traditional infrastructure um, uh, restrictions that are, that are uh, throttling capacity. Um, and I guess my hope is that we can, wh whatever process comes out of this can be organized in a way that um, can identify, can really pinpoint what those 
pinch points are and then turn into a different process that you know provides funding for to, to overcome whatever uh those those factors are so um yeah that's i guess that's my hope for any changes to the to the goal 14 process yeah great thank you for that uh barbara i see your hand up i would i would um second what samuel just talked about for the city of cornelius um we are still struggling with trying to find a fire truck that is affordable that could reach heights greater than what we have today so that we could be more um we could build higher buildings um so we are struggling with that and then the other thing is we just passed a fire levy to have two firefighters on three shifts so that's how tight our budget is for firefighting so it's not just the truck it's the staff it's everything having to do with growth so Trying to get the bigger picture for the smaller cities, I think, is really important. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And and really thinking about infrastructure maybe in a bigger way, um, uh, more more inclusive way. Any other thoughts on this? And if, well, I'll give it a minute. Go ahead, Maddie. To share a little bit, uh, in, unless there are other comments about those two uh, two points raised about fire capacity and, and the ability to serve um, upzoning or, or larger development buildings, um, I encountered this in the city of Crestwell as a planner, worked there for nine years, and it was actually a very interesting conversation that, uh, just to share that some of our team members have some background and capacity in these particular areas, and there are some solutions that are uh, feasible and accessible. It's about convening um, folks with the right level of open-mindedness about what the path forward looks like and using uh, a lot of collaboration between communities, whether they be district communities encircling the whole uh, fire district itself, um, and or city resources that of those cities included in those districts and thinking about what the benefit is to the greater community. In our case, it was um, looking at the uh, fire protection ratings and the effects on fire insurance. So the ability to serve the community better by up, upgrading a, a truck in this case um, brought down all, all members um, fire protection costs or insurance costs. So there was just a, a, a meaningful conversation that was had, but to your point, um, looking at ways that we can, we're, a, a number of challenges are going to come up in our conversations that will not necessarily be in the purview of DLCD's charge. However, we have a full faith effort to, to relay those challenges and to work with other outside partners to, to address them in a meaningful way so that our work is successful. So thank you for bringing those up. And I've, yes, thank you, Maddie. And I've heard uh, DLCD also talk about how that's um, also partners within the state that have impacts on these things as well. Um, anything else on this topic? All right, thank you. Um, so why don't we go ahead and, oh, let me stop sharing. Um, we will go ahead and conclude. We'll wrap things up here for just hang with me for a couple more minutes. Um, we are working to uh, look at all, you all produced a lot of feedback in the whiteboard. Thank you so much. It's super important. We will be taking that um, sort of uh reading them all in detail, starting to organize them um, and filtering through sort of what are ripe topics for rulemaking, what might need to go into that um, holding pen for things that come after rulemaking, either in guidance documents or some other uh, project. But we'll be bringing those into the technical advisory committee meetings. Um, I think we can commit to that. Um, and also sort of filtering all these comments back up to the RAC who's um, providing that policy guidance and um, getting some feedback from, from them about uh, what they would like to move forward with rulemaking in each of these topics. Um, so uh, 
I won't recap all of that. I will say, I think what we're gonna do here, um, we can leave the mirror board open for just a little bit more, but I think we're gonna lock it down because it is open. We wanna make sure these comments are reflective of the people in the room. Um, and then uh, we can share that with you. And then we'll also have a post-meeting survey where you can add more comments on these topics and we can um, compile them with anything that's on the Miro board. Um, so thank you for that. And um, I am going to hand it over to Ethan for concluding comments and anything else I missed. Thanks, Deb. And thank you all for the conversation, both you know uh, verbally, but then also on the Miro board. And um, I'm haven't been able to, you know, there's just so much content on the mirror board that I haven't been able to read it. And I'm excited to kind of uh, summarize that and, you know, kind of dive in. So just a, a note of much appreciation to you all today for taking the time and, and having that conversation with us. I think um, if that is uh, illustrative at all of how this process is going to go and the conversation that we're going to have, I think we're uh, prepared for, you know, a really good, um, you know, round of advisory committee processes here. So um, in terms of kind of next steps and follow up, I guess I get the benefit of, you know, kind of starting this conversation and then, you know, remembering throughout the course of the meeting, all the things I forgot to say uh, and get a chance to say that again at the end. So, um, you know, in terms of kind of next steps, where we go from here, uh, we'll be taking the technical advisory committee and the rulemaking advisory committees will be taking a break. So we'll have no more meetings in 2023 and we will reconvene all of those groups after the short session, the short legislative session and uh, reconvening all of these groups in about March of 2024. So in those intervening months, uh, we'll be working on you know, describing a little bit more and articulating and putting down on paper a little bit more of the the process and those major milestones that we're hoping to accomplish and fleshing out all the big questions and the sub questions and the sub sub questions that we'll have to go through and answer in this process um, and providing a lot more kind of background policy briefings for you all to kind of chew on as we're going through and answering those questions. So be looking for a lot more, um, you know, deeper dive into these conversations that we've kept at the general high level at this point in time uh, over the next couple of months. The other thing to note here is that the technical advisory, at least in terms of how we're thinking about kind of structuring the the meetings and the timelines, we don't have the meetings set yet for the technical advisory committees and you know the cadence at which those meetings will take place. But what we do know for certain is that the technical advisory committees are likely to meet much more frequently than the rulemaking advisory committee. And I think we've hopefully articulated that expectation to you all as part of the um, invitation to participate on, on these advisory committees. So we're you know, at this point in time, kind of thinking somewhere in the vicinity of once every other week for much shorter meetings. We're not going to try to meet with you for three hours every every other week. Well, we are totally recognized that's, that's a lot of time. So we'll keep those meetings much shorter, but just more frequent. There's going to be lots of the opportunity for you to share your feedback for DLCD that attend, then take that back, chew on it, work work it into actual uh, language, and then meet again to further advance that work. So the tax will be kind of moving along more frequently, probably meeting anywhere in the vicinity of two to three times before the rack meets again. Um, and that will help kind of facilitate the in the weeds conversations much more, you know, frequently and and uh, happening at a much quicker rate, and then focus kind of more on the high level policy things at a slower, more, um, uh, I guess not not really leisurely pace, but comparatively leisure like leisurely, I guess. Uh, and then finally, like we've mentioned in throughout the course of this meeting, you'll have an opportunity to provide public comments or feedback or suggestions, whatever you uh, need to do throughout this entire process. So we've got a couple mechanisms in place. We'll have, of course, these meetings, which is kind of option number one. Option number two is in within the meetings, those mirror boards of kind of those using software and technology to solicit your input. And then finally, after outside of the meetings um, themselves, we'll have these post-meeting surveys that you'll all get in your inbox in just a couple hours. Um, and you'll have a chance to 
kind of sit with the conversation, reflect, have conversations with within your organization, within with your constituents, chew on those, provide additional feedback at a later time. So that'll be coming here shortly. And then finally, open at all times, 24 seven, at all times, you can send us an email to that email address that Deb just put in the chat, housing.dlcd at dlcd.org.gov, which is a funny email address, but it's the one that we have. Um, so, you know, there's, we're, we're available. I think that's generally what we're trying to, trying to show with all of those opportunities. We're available to have those conversations, available to, you know, solicit that input and your feedback because you are advisory to us and we are not going to be uh, super helpful to LCDC if we don't have the conversation with you all about how we draft those rules. So I think that is about it in terms of next steps for me, Deb. Um, I think that's right, yes. All right, well, um, thank you all for being here. Thank you for entering the discussion with this large group, really appreciate it. Um, and as Ethan mentioned, sort of next steps, you'll be hearing directly from your tech lead um, about uh, sort of organizing meetings and um, preparing for the next set of meetings. But there'll be um, a little bit of pause while we get that organized. And then of course we won't be meeting until after the short session and don't hesitate to be in touch in the meantime. And the mirror board, maybe we'll leave it open until noon for you if you want to add a last few minutes um, and then we'll lock it. You'll still be able to see it, but we'll we'll lock it down for comments. Thank you all again and we'll um, see you again soon. <laughs>